insects not only transmit disease-causing organisms between animal hosts, they are also important vectors of plant diseases. Arthropod-borne diseases of plants can cause substantial economic damage to forests, agriculture, and horticultural plantings. Many organisms that cause diseases in plants are transmitted by arthropods. Vectors of these disease-causing organisms include many members of the order Hemiptera, such as aphids, leafhoppers, and planthoppers. If infected, these insects can introduce disease-causing organisms directly into a plant when they insert their piercing-sucking mouth parts to feed on plant tissues. Other examples of plant disease vectors include bark beetles, which spend part of their life cycle within the host tree. Other arthropods act as vectors of plant diseases as well, such as mites, and even non-arthropod invertebrates like nematodes. Disease-causing organisms vectored by arthropods include viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Let's begin by first examining the relationship between plant viruses and insect vectors. Plant viruses can be classified according to how they are transmitted between plant hosts. These types of transmission are referred to as non-persistent, semi-persistent, and persistent transmission. Non-persistent transmission occurs when viruses are retained only on the mouth parts of the insect vector and are then inoculated into the plant tissue during feeding. Depending on the virus and vector species, the virus may remain infectious on the vector's mouth parts for minutes or hours. Non-persistent viruses usually have low vector specificity and can be immediately transmitted to other plants without an incubation period. Transmission of non-persistent plant viruses is unique to aphids. Just as with non-persistent transmission, vectors that transmit viruses in a semi-persistent manner can acquire and transmit the virus in a short time span because they don't usually require an incubation period before becoming infectious. This also means that the length of time spent feeding influences disease transmission, with a longer feeding period increasing the probability of disease transmission. Plant viruses that are transmitted semi-persistently are retained within the foregut of the vector in the cuticular layer only, as the viruses do not move into the insect's tissues. The viruses also don't circulate or replicate within the vector. In order to transmit a virus in a persistent manner, vectors usually need an extended feeding period to acquire and transmit the virus, and are generally not able to transmit a virus immediately after feeding. Persistently transmitted viruses are often maintained within the vector for the remainder of its lifespan. Vectors are competent to transmit the virus for a long period of time, even across molds. This is because the virus is not restricted to the mouth parts or foregut of the insect, since it circulates and sometimes replicates within various organs in the insect vector. The viruses can enter the midgut and the hemocele, from which they colonize other tissues, such as the salivary glands and the ovaries. By infecting these other tissues, some viruses that are transmitted in a persistent fashion can therefore be maintained transgenerationally and passed from female vectors to their offspring. Leafhoppers often transmit viral plant diseases persistently, which can make them important agricultural pests. One common viral plant disease which is persistently transmitted is the potato leaf roll virus. This virus is vectored by the polyphagous green peach aphid. It is one of the most important potato diseases in the world and is particularly problematic in countries with limited resources for disease management. Infection usually results in chlorosis, or purpling, of the tops of plants, as well as curling of the leaves. If the infection spreads to the roots, it can stunt plant growth and cause internal necrosis of the potato roots and tubers. Depending on the severity of the infection, losses can range from 30 to 70 percent of total yield. Insects may also contribute to the spread of bacterial plant diseases. This occurs with fire blight, a disease caused by the bacteria Erwinia amylivora. The bacteria primarily infect cultivated pear and apple trees and can colonize virtually all tissues, including the stems, leaves, flowers, and fruits. Infection causes the plant tissues to wilt and darken. This results in a fire-scorched appearance to leaves and twigs, while infected flowers give rise to infected fruits. 
bacterial ooze is produced at the surface of infected fruits before they too wither and darken. Infections are often spread by wind or rain to new tissues or plants, as droplets of bacterial ooze are dispersed from cankers in which the bacteria overwinter. Insects also spread the bacteria as they feed and cause damage to various plant tissues. This includes insects which feed by chewing or sucking on plant tissues like leaves, and wood borers which cause stem damage. Insect pollinators can even spread the disease between blossoms. Fire blight can be exceptionally destructive to cultivated pears and apples, with some outbreaks destroying entire orchard blocks. Since this disease can have such significant impacts, the disease is controlled with careful monitoring and pruning of trees to remove early infections and prevent the spread of the bacterial disease. Dutch elm disease is a well-known fungal disease of elm trees. This disease is invasive to North America and has significantly impacted American elm trees across the continent. The disease is caused by the fungus Ophiostoma ulmi. While most fungal plant diseases are dispersed mainly through wind, rain, and soil, Dutch elm disease is vectored by various species of elm bark beetles. When the fungus grows within the vascular tissues of infected trees, it blocks nutrient and water transport throughout the tree. Initial symptoms of this disease include yellowing and browning of foliage near the site of infection. As the fungus continues to spread, symptoms worsen until the entire tree dies. In healthy trees, the progression of Dutch elm disease usually takes years, but susceptible or weakened trees may die within months of infection. This disease has resulted in the death of many natural and horticultural elm populations across North America. Control efforts cost several hundred thousand dollars each year in Winnipeg, Manitoba, a city with over 200,000 elms where the disease has become established. In Alberta, where the disease is not yet present, it's estimated that there are over 600,000 elms worth over $2 billion. Careful monitoring and preventative protocols are in place to prevent the spread of the disease to these trees. We spoke with a professor at McEwen University, Leah Flaherty, who told us a bit about the history of Dutch elm disease in North America and how we can deal with this threat. So Dutch elm disease arrived in North America um, from Europe in the 1930s. And um, although the fungus was transported to the US via Europe, it actually uh, originates from Asia, okay, where Asian elm trees who have co-evolved, have a long co-evolutionary history with Dutch elm disease are actually quite resistant um, to the fungus. Um, However, in Europe, as well as in North America, our, our elm trees are not very re resistant to D Dutch elm disease. So both in Europe and then eventually in North America, um, once the fungus was introduced, there's you know, significant um, uh, reductions or significant mortality of, of elm tree species, American elm. Okay, so the European elm bark beetle, unfortunately, was introduced around the same time as the Dutch elm disease itself. Um, so a bit of a, a double whammy because that particular bark beetle um, can vector the pathogen and, and more efficiently than the North American um, bark beetle species associated with elm. Although our North American species certainly can uh, vector it as well. Um, so introduced into North America in the 30s, a decade or so later, sometime in the 40s, was introduced to the Eastern Canada, and then subsequently over the last several decades has uh, moved its way um, westward. Uh, so we've lost many elm trees, both in, in natural forest ecosystems as well as in cities um, to Dutch elm disease. Um, in fact, about 80% of the elm trees in Toronto were killed by Dutch elm disease. Um, which, you know, as a bit of an aside, is quite problematic because oftentimes these trees were replaced by ash trees, which are now being killed in, in, in equally high numbers by, or perhaps greater numbers, by emerald ash borer. Um, so luckily, um, Dutch elm disease hasn't spread from coast to coast, so British Columbia and Alberta are, are still um, for the most part, Dutch elm disease free. Um, there was one tree in the Wainwright area in Alberta 
um, confirmed to have Dutch elm disease, but it was um, eliminated in Alberta is still considered um, Dutch elm disease free. And Alberta is uh, very proud of our Dutch elm disease free status and, and I believe to have the largest sort of population of Dutch elm disease free trees in, in American elm disease trees in, in North America. So in general, the management of Dutch elm disease um, involves intensive surveys and moni monitoring um, for signs and symptoms of the disease. And, and the, um, a big component of the management program is to detect um, Dutch elm disease early, uh, signs and symptoms, and to destroy trees um, appropriately um, in order to, to prevent the, the spread. There's also some fungicides that are used as well. There used to be more of a focus um, on controlling um, the, the beetles that vector the disease or the fungus, but um, we now know that that's not particularly effective. So instead, early monitoring for signs and symptoms and destroying those trees, as well as use of the fungicide is uh, what's more commonly used now. Yeah, so probably the most important thing, particularly if you have elm trees on your property, um, and the same goes for uh, emerald ash borer and ash trees as well, is to know the signs and symptoms of the particular invasive species. In this case, we're talking about Dutch elm disease. Be aware of the signs and, and symptoms and um, report any suspect uh, tree immediately so that it, it can be dealt with. Um, also just keeping your tree healthy, so keeping it well watered, um, pruning it, but also following some guidelines with respect to pruning. So typically you want to prune it um, at the times of the year when the, when the beetle, the bark beetle that vectors the disease is inactive, um, which is in sort of late fall and winter, and, and avoid pruning in the active season in the summer. Um, yeah, those are probably the more important recommendations. Oh, and then of course don't move firewood. So. Um, Certainly in the areas where Dutch elm disease um, is present, there'll be, there'll be regulations that prevent or restrict the movement of, of elm wood or, um, or elm trees or elm branches. But um, a more general recommendation for preventing the spread of an invasive species or bark and wood boring beetles specifically um, is, to, is to, to not move firewood at all. So make sure that you're, you're buying or sourcing your firewood on site if you think you're gonna be using it when you're out camping. Serumbicids, I worked on serumbicids for my PhD and kind of continue to, so.